it had happened that morning at the ministry if anything so nebulous could be said to happen. It was nearly 1100 and in the records department where Winston worked they were dragging the chairs out of the cubicles and grouping them in the center of the hall opposite the big telescreen in preparation for the two minutes hate. Winston was just taking his place in one of the middle rows when two people whom he knew by sight but had never spoken to came unexpectedly into the room. One of them was a girl whom he often passed in the corridors. He did not know her name, but he knew that she worked in the fiction department. Presumably, since he had sometimes seen her with oily hands and carrying a spanner, she had some mechanical job on one of the novel writing machines. She was a bold looking girl of about 27 with thick dark hair, a freckled face and swift athletic movements. A narrow scarlet sash, emblem of the junior anti-sex league, was wound several times round the waist of her overalls, just tightly enough to bring out the shape lines of her hips. Winston had disliked her from the very first moment of seeing her. He knew the reason. It was because of the atmosphere of hockey fields and cold baths and community hikes and general clean-mindedness which she managed to carry about with her. He disliked nearly all women, and especially the young and pretty ones. It was always the women, and above all the young ones, who were the most begoated adherents of the party, the swallowers of the slogans, the amateur spies and the nosers out of unorthodoxy. But this particular girl gave him the impression of being more dangerous than most. Once, when they had passed in the corridor, she had given him a quick sidelong glance which seemed to pierce right into him and for a moment had filled him with black terror. The idea had even crossed his mind that she might be an agent of the Thought Police. That, it was true, was very unlikely. Still, he continued to feel a peculiar uneasiness which had fear mixed up in it as well as hostility whenever she was anywhere near him. The other person was a man named O'Brien, a member of the inner party and holder of some post so important and remote that Winston had only a dim idea of its nature. A momentary hush passed over the group of people round the chairs as they saw the black overalls of an inner party member approaching. O'Brien was a large, burly man with a thick neck and a coarse, humorous, brutal face. In spite of his formidable appearance, he had a certain charm of manner. He had a trick of resettling his spectacles on his nose, which was curiously disarming, in some w indefinable way curiously civilized. It was a gesture which, if anyone had still thought in such terms, might have recalled an 18th century nobleman offering his snuff box. Winston had seen O'Brien perhaps a dozen times in almost as many years. He felt deeply drawn to him, and not solely because he was intrigued by the contrast between O'Brien's urban manner and his prize fighter's physique. Much more it was because of a secretly held belief, or perhaps not even a belief, merely a hope, that O'Brien's political orthodoxy was not perfect. Something in his face suggested it irresistibly. And again, perhaps it was not even an orthodoxy that was written in his face, but simply intelligence. But at any rate, he had the appearance of being a person that you could talk to if somehow you could cheat the telescreen and get him alone. Winston had never made the smallest effort to verify his guess. Indeed, there was no way of doing so. At this moment, O'Brien glanced at his wristwatch, saw that it was nearly 1100 and evidently de decided to stay in the records department until a two minutes hate was over. He took a chair in the same row as Winston, a couple of places away. A small, sandy-haired woman 
who worked in the next cubicle to Winston was between them. The girl with dark hair was sitting immediately behind. The next moment a hideous grinding screech as of some monstrous machine running without oil burst from the big telescreen at the end of the room. It was a noise that set one's teeth on edge and bristled the hair at the back of one's neck. The hate had started. As usual, the face of Emmanuel Goldstein, the enemy of the people, had flashed onto the screen. There were hisses here and there among the audience. The little sandy-haired woman gave a squeak of mingled fear and disgust. Goldstein was the renegade and black slider who once long ago, how long ago nobody quite remembered, had been one of the leading figures of the party, almost on a level with Big Brother himself, and then had engaged in counter-revolutionary activities, had been condemned to death and had mysteriously escaped and disappeared. The programs of the two minutes hate varied from day to day, but there was none in which Goldstein was not the principal figure. He was the primal traitor, the earliest defiler of the party's purity. All subsequent crimes against the party, all treacheries, acts of sabotage, heresies, deviations, sprang directly out of his teaching. Somewhere or other he was still alive and hatching his conspiracies, perhaps somewhere beyond the sea, under the protection of his foreign paymasters, perhaps even, so it was occasionally rumored, in some place in Oceania itself. Winston's diaphragm was constricted. He could never see the face of Goldstein without a painful mixture of emotions. It was a lean Jewish face with a great fuzzy aureole of white hair and a small goatee beard, a clever face, and yet somehow inherently despicable, with a kind of senile silliness in the long thin nose near the end of which a pair of spectacles was perched. It resembled the face of a sheep, and the voice too had a sheep-like quality. Goldstein was delivering his usual venomous attack upon the doctrines of the party, an attack so exaggerated and perverse that a child should have been able to see through it, and yet just plausible enough to fill one with an alarming feeling that other people, less level-headed than oneself, might be taken by it. He was abusing Big Brother, he was denouncing the dictatorship of the party, he was demanding the immediate conclusion of peace with Eurasia, he was advocating freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, freedom of thought, he was crying hysterically that the revolution had been betrayed, and all this in rapid polysyllabic speech, which was a sort of parody of the habitual style of the orators of the party, and even contained newspeak words, more newspeak words indeed, than any party member would normally use in real life. And all the while, lest one should be in any doubt as to the reality which Goldst Goldstein's specious claptrap covered, behind his head on the telescreen there marched the endless columns of the Eurasian army, row after row, of solid-looking men with expressionless Asiatic faces, who swam up to the surface of the screen and vanished to be replaced by others exactly similar. The dull rhythmic trap of the soldier's boots formed the background to Goldstein's bleating voice.